Okay, thanks for coming and welcome to our data odyssey. Oops, it's not working. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> My name is Ricardo Fanjul and I have been working in the new LetGo data platform for the last two years. LetGo is a second-hand marketplace with more than 100 million of downloads and more than 400 million of listings. The amount of data that flows in LetGo platform is huge. For example, our users have sent between each other over 7 billion of messages since LetGo launched in 2015. 7 billion is like each person in the planet has sent a message with us. Some numbers of our platform are 1 billion of, mess of events processed daily, peak of more than 50,000 events per second, more than 600 event types, 200 terabytes of data in our data lake, and most important, we process these events in near real time with latencies under one second. The road wasn't easy. We started as many other startups with limited resources and a few users. Our architecture started with a traditional BI architecture. We had a business analytics team competing for SCAR resources. At first, we execute our queries against MariaDB. Then we moved to MariaDB Slave and as usual, the next step was a set of ETL process. With the aim of copying data from MariaDB to receive. Although the problem kept appearing. Every day we have a growing number of users and new members joining the BI team. As a result, we, ha we started having scalability problems. In addition, we began to have more and more complex use cases. So for all of that, the traditional BI architecture didn't meet our requirement. We needed something new. This wasn't only a data problem. All let go faced with similar scalability problem. So we decided to move from a monolithic architecture to an architecture based on microservices and events. So how to develop an event-driven data architecture. The first step is to understand what an event is. We have two kinds of events. Tracking events represent the user interactions into the app. For example, the user visit a product or the user make a search. And domain events are those events that capture the memory of something interesting for let go. For instance, a user has been registered or a product has been published. These are the three stages of our talk. We will talk from the data recollection until the data exploitation. The first one is the ingest. In LetGo, all our team publish domain events into SNS channels, and then we can subscribe SQS queues to these channels. Our goal was to move these events to a more data-friendly broker. In the end, we choose Kafka. We try multiple options for, for these tags. We try Apache Flume, FluentD, Kafka REST Proxy, also Kinesis with Firehose. But none of these alternatives combines us. I watched a talk about Kafka Connect and everything fitted with our idea. Kafka Connect has all the good things of Kafka and a part of that comes with dozens of connectors. But what is a connector? Kafka Connect has two connector times, types, Source, they allow us to read from external component and publish the event into, into Kafka, while others are things. They allow us to read events from Kafka and publish the events to external components. We started with an open source SQS connector, but it didn't read the performance that we need. You know, it only processed around 1,000 events per second, and we needed much more. So we have to create a custom connector. And it was really easy. To write a custom connector, you only, to you only need to implement a few classes. And all the difficult things are done by Kafka Connect framework with outstanding performance.
I'm sorry, it's not working. This was the moment that changed everything. Now, everything that happened in Let Go is stored in real time into Kafka, so we can start thinking about how to process these events. Our journey to the start begins. Okay. <laughs> The first step is how to build the data lake. We want to store our events into S3 and keep them forever in order to use them later. We try two options, Kafka Connect and Spark. But in order to justify our choose, we have to talk about some problems. Because the wall is not perfect and sometimes shit happens. Our architecture ensures that we never lose events. However, duplicating events could happen. For this reason, we decide to use Cassandra for the duplicate our event. We can write several times the same event into Cassandra, but because each domain event contains a unique identifier, in the end, Cassandra, we only have one copy of the event. So we have achieved our desired duplication. After that, we only need to read events from, uh, from Cassandra and write them into S3 as raw event and also as in parquet format in order to optimize our analytical queries. The next problem that we face is that sometimes the events arrive late, hours, even days later. Consequently, if we only read events from Cassandra and write them into S3, we could lose some very late events. Some companies repeat this process with different intervals of time, one hour, one day later, but in this way, we could always lose some very late events. So we designed a solution that we call Dirty Bucket. But what is Dirty Bucket? First, we read events from Kafka and write them into S3, into Cassandra. But in this step, for each combination between event type, our, we publish a domain event. We publish a domain event into a compact Kafka tro uh, topic. So now the Spark job only needs to read from this topic in order to know which combination between event type our should be processed. The job read the events, the required events from Cassandra and finally write them into S3 without the possibility of losing events. There are also some problems with S3. Since S3 and HDFS are different, we face with eventual consistency and very slow renames. You might face with this error. Your job starts writing in S3 and suddenly you receive a not phone error. The reason of this zero is S3 eventual consistency. Your job write to some node in S3 and then try to write, read the file again. But another node of S3 without the file receives the request. As a result, S3 return an error. Luckily, we can use S3 guard to handle this problem, both in Cloudera and in Horton words. S3 guard works logging all the metadata, metadata chains made in S3 to external consistency uh, storage, named the metadata storage. Since metadata storage is consistent, S3i can use it to fill the missing state not yet visible in S3. Have you, have you write a job that writes a lot of data into S3 that in the end look like it's frozen? It doesn't have any active tags, but it's still running. What is happening? In order to maintain the consistency of data in case of failure, Spark write the data to a temporal folder and only in the last, last step move the data to its final location. This happens instantly in ATFS, however, in S3 is a very time-consuming operation because moving a file in S3 means copying the file and then deleting the old one. This is not convenient uh, when you work with big files and is, also, is, and is worse when you work with many files. 
the way to address this problem is to use the new S3 i committers. In let go, we try the MyGit committer. Now, everything that happened in let go is in stored in Kafka in real time. We have built our data lake, and now it's time to think about how to make data processing. There are two ways to make data processing, streaming and batching. Uh, let's start with the streaming. In let go, we have several apps running in the streaming, but we are going to talk about two of them. The first one, real-time user segmentation. We want to classify we want to classify our users in real time, so for that we create an app using a stream that processes all the behavior events. We design it using event sourcing, and these are the stages that happen in the processing of an event. First of all, we have to restore the user state, reading it from the snapshot and the journal, then rewrite the new event into the journal, and finally, we apply the rule publishing a domain event in, ca in case of a new user state has been detected. Let go uses this e event to change its behavior. For example, the notification sent by let go or the result sold in the feed depends on the user state. The second example is our users also interact between each other. These are the typical questions that happens in a conversation between them. But for us, it was very difficult to understand what happened in a conversation, and we want to improve our user experience. The solution was structured data. We send messages that a machine can understand. Our idea, our first idea, was to improve the proposal of meetings. The, the user, sorry. The user click on a button, select a place to meet between a, a list of suggested place, select the time, and finally search the proposal. And the other user and the other user receives the proposal in a nice interactive widget, accepting or rejecting the proposal. How to detect these patterns? Welcome to Complex Event Processing, a technology that you can use in case that you need to detect pattern between events. With this technology, you can detect things like a meeting proposal followed by a meeting accepted means meeting schedule, and we publish a domain event that represents its match, or a meeting proposal not followed by an answer within a day, we can detect this pattern and publish a domain event. You have a pending proposal. As part, doesn't have this technology, so for this use case, we have to use Apache Flink. Another typical uses of thefts are frog detection and real-time user recommendations. The next step in our journey is batching. What seems to be the most important of our architecture is that we try to make as few batches as possible. We will see later how we do it, but for now, let's see a very interesting batch sample. This is an example of domain event with latitude and longitude. This is technically correct, however, it doesn't add much value. Without a context, coordinate and lonely dot in the space, but when you provide a context, like state, city, postal code, they become something valuable. Enriching one event with this information is easy. The problem shows up when you have to enrich millions of events. To handle this problem, we create geospatial indexes using GTS and geotools and call them from SPAR SQL in order to process millions of events using only SQL. We are about to finish our journey, and now it's time to talk about data exploration. The first thing is how to query data. One ring to rule them all. But I don't want to use the language of Mordor. I want to use SQL. Let's see how to do it. Using Hive, you can read from dozens of data sources. In the image, some of the data sources used by LetGo. However, with time, Hive has become a bit obsolete for some use cases. 
As a result, new technologies has appeared around the Hive Metastore in order to replace Hive. The most important among them are Impala, PrestoDB, and Spark. And here is where our idea of democratizing data come in. We want to query all our data using SQL. How we can do it? Using Spark 3 Server, we can read from all of our data sources. We only need to create the table over some of the supported data sources. For example, ATFS with JSON, S3 with Parquet, Cassandra, Recif, and once done, we can query data in a unified way using SQL, making joins between data sources. What is the difference between these two create table statements? The first one uses high serializers and the serializers, and the second one uses Spark native serializer. In our test, the second one gave up up to 70% speed up. As I told you before, we, we try to make as few batches as possible. We prefer to use SQL. First, we have to create the table over some of the supported data sources. As you can see in the image, S3. Then, the second step is the insertion. This statement is composed on two parts. The select, when you can make queries and joins over all your data, and the insertion. In this part, pay attention to override and partition keyboards in order to append data without duplication. We run the query. And apps, we have a problem. We get 200 small files. But why 200? The reason is, it's the default value of this property. So we have to add something more to our query. We have three options. Distributed by, we will get one file per date. Clustered by, we will get multiple files because it's an alias of the last option over, so, over all the indicated columns. And distribute byte with sort byte. We will get only one file sorted, in this case, by user ID. But why a uh, sorted file could be important? The reason is, what is the most common SPAR join? Sort, merge, join. So if we want to make a query between two tables, the first step is going to be a sort. So if we have the file sorted, the join will be much faster. We change our query. and we achieve our desired result. Now it's time to see a global vision of our architecture. On the right, some data sources uh, used by LetGo, and on the left, some dashboarding tools like Superset, Bind, Tableau, and data science tools like RStudio, Jupyter, Zeppelin, or Spark, all of them connected using the Spark 3 server and the high Metastore. For some people, this is the typical data science team, adorable creatures that you want to cuddle. But I see them as evil machines that want to destroy my cluster. Why I think in this way? Basically, data scientists are the main users of our architecture, and as everybody knows, users do unexpected things. Sometimes, very bad things. Let's talk about data scientists' sins. Look, there are more than 3,000 small files. And as you know, small files are very bad for big data. I have already told you how to fix this problem. Huge queries. 
Usually, we can find patterns inside Hue queries. For example, the same condition, aggregation. So in order to fix this problem, we should split the queries in a smaller part and try to, to pre-compute it uh, hourly, weekly, monthly. Two mass shuffle. They don't only make our queries slower, they could also fill the disk, generating instability in our cluster. The solution should be uh, found case by case, but in general, we should minimize the moved data. We have to filter out data as soon as possible, for example, uh, making uh, adding work clauses in subselect, making aggregation in subselect, or selecting only the required columns. For the orchestration of our pipelines, we choose Airflow. In Airflow, we can, we can see our executed, running, or failed tasks. And the most important, our data scientists can develop their data pipelines in an autonomous way. They don't require to the developer's help. So they can explore all our data. And when they find something interesting, they can schedule the recollection of this data. As we saw before, they can, they can create the table and then execute the insertion in the wanted frequency, hourly, monthly, weekly, all made using simple Python code. OK. But when we believe that we have the perfect platform, we found some problems. On one hand, we wanted to try new technologies, but in the other hand, trying something new was very dangerous because a lot of features depend on our cluster and we couldn't afford to break it. Also, since our cluster was built mainly, mainly manually, starting a new one was a very expensive operation. So we decided to address this problem in two steps. The first one, moving all the data from ADFS to S3. And the second one, automating the creation of new clusters using a cloud break. It was a big challenge. We have to make thousands of tags in order to complete the migration, but we did it. And we got new capabilities. Right now, we can start a new cluster in less than 20 minutes. We migrate to Hadoop 3, and most important, we improve our experimenting capabilities. Right now, we can start, uh, when we need to try something new, we can start a new cluster in our development environment with different configuration, and we, we get the decided configuration, we can start a new cluster in production, redirect the traffic, and also, in case of failure, we can roll back to the previous one. We finally arrived to our destination. And something wonderful will happen. Thanks to our platform, we could start trying new ideas. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Our data scientists developed this idea within a week. Point to the product with your camera, and we make all the work for you in real time. It was a video, but it's not working. I'm sorry. The only way to discover the limit of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. This is not the, the end of the story. We are now working in a new wonderful ideas, and now is your turn. Do you want to develop the future? Do you want to join us?
This is them. Hey, uh, good talk here. Well, uh, what are you? Sorry. Just. Ah, okay. <laughs> And one question, well, two questions. Uh, the first one is, um, you say that you were using Cassandra for yeah. uh, the duplicating events. Yes. Uh, did you try uh, Kafka Streams uh, for that? Because uh, uh, it also provides uh, the exactly once delivery if you want. Yeah. No, uh, we didn't try Kafka Streams. Yeah, it provides exactly one, but the problem is, as I said, events could arrive very late, sometimes days later. So with Kafka Stream, it's impossible to make that because when you have one billion of events daily, maintain this amount of data in Kafka Stream for one day, two days, three days, is impossible. So uh, in the past, we tried another solution based on, for example, Hazelcast, or, but store this data in memory is impossible. And just, I was wondering, which computer are you using? Yeah, it's an iPad Pro. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I'm a Linux guy, so I have to use this, this one. No, I try it in, in, my, in my company, and it works quarterly. Maybe it's a problem with the projector, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry, because the, the slide was very, very nice, but you can see any transition, so, sorry. Okay, so, ah. Hello, uh, I, I think I, I, I got the, uh, the, the presentation pretty well. I mean, it was blinking a little bit, but uh, you, you did a really good job with the presentation. It, it looked very nice. Uh, I, was, I had two questions. The first one is if you could put the presentation somewhere so that I can take a look more, uh, yes, yes. more at home. Of course, I, I served the presentation with Pete, so okay. it's going to be open. Okay, and uh, my real question was, could you expand on the problem that you had with S3 and the small files? I didn't understand uh, what, what the problem was and how you fixed it. Thank you. Yeah, okay. The problem is not uh, something about S3, it's in general. A store a small files is not good because when you, if you have a hundred, thousand, million of a small files, it's worse because it's a round trip. It's time you, you need to read the data, you have to read the small file, the small file, it has a lot of latencies. So uh, the, the problem with the small file is as default, as I saw you in, in the presentation, uh, you will get 200 small files. And the, the way to fix it, in general, is to make the, include some kind of partition. So in this way, all the data for some partition, for example, of date, of hour, is going to be only in one file. Yeah, you, you can see in the presentation. You have to add some some keyboard. You can use a distribute byte, and it's going to be fixed. You have to create a table with partition a table, and after that, use that distribute byte, and it's going to be fixed. Hi. Here. Uh, you mentioned you were you you used Kafka instead of a simple queue service or Kinesis or anything else. Yeah. What specifically was it about Kafka? And uh, secondly, since you're running Kafka, how is the operational experience of running your own Kafka cluster? Okay. Uh, Kafka is wonderful. Our experience is, is a fantastic technology. It works very nice. The administrator uh, Kafka is really easy. So, and also, it's wonderful in general. I can show something better. It's the most stable technology in our state, in our stack. Um, do you want to know why we don't use Kinesis or? I'm just curious why Kafka, because my experience wasn't like that a few years ago when I tried it, so okay. it was just surprising. But yeah. many people are using We started it. with Kafka two years ago, and also we tried Kinesis, but the problem with Kinesis is it's not possible to use, for example, Kafka Connect, that is a fantastic technology, and also you can have more control using Kafka, uh, Kafka Streams. Of course, it's more cheap because 
Kinesis is good if you only need some string, you start using, but when you start to have billions of events, it's going to be very expensive compared with Kafka. So if you have a big company, it's a better option to use Kafka in the point of view of money, but also in the point of view of, of capabilities. Thanks. Uh, and how is the operational experience of maintaining your own Kafka cluster? It is very easy to operate Kafka. It's, it's a very good uh, technology. Our experience is, is good. We never had any problem with Kafka. And it's something difficult to say it about other technologies. Hello, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. How do you secure the system? Uh, okay, secure. I'm sorry, I, I, can't, I can't talk about the security of our platform for, for reason of my company. I can share this one for you. So, so sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. You said uh, you solved small files problem by merging uh, them into a single file. How about uh, writing performance, I think? Uh, if uh, output size is too large, such as tens or hundreds gigabytes, uh, yep. only single executor uh, struggle. Yeah, of course. Yeah. If you want to have only one file, the insertion time is going to be a bit higher, of course, but you have to think about a query time. You only write one time, but you query data a lot of time, so we have to think about query time. So, of course, the insertion is, is slower. Thank you.